my little clicker. Read your fresh sheet as well, if everyone got one. Yeah, go ahead and put that up, Joe. The message. I got to turn that on, too. Probably helps. So I've been doing this kind of strange mashup sermon series, and I don't know how long I'm going to do it. Probably till I get bored. <laughs> what, you thought there was any other spiritual reason for why I preach on what I preach on? We're going to go slowly through the life of Jesus. We're going to see what he did. Then we're going to see what Paul says about the same subject and how it affects our identity. So today we're going to look at John the Baptist. Now, I need you to stretch your brains a little bit because this isn't as nice, tightly knit packaged together as they normally are. There is a common theme going through the whole thing, but you've got to kind of lean your head. So can you kind of lean your mental head to kind of walk? Anyway, like you have a choice. So Lord, just bless the time and everybody said. This is the part we want you to walk away with. The degree you agree with your identity is the degree you walk in victory, embody his glory, and apply his authority. Now let me ask you, how many of you have situations where you need a victory? Two of you. How many of you want to be the person in your world that everybody looks to to be the spiritual support? How many of you have situations in your life where the devil is running crazy and you need to learn to apply your authority? What does it all come back to? Agreeing, Agreeing with your identity. You might say, I have a hard time. I don't feel like agreeing with the fact that I'm a new creation or I must have a, a must spirit. I must be about my father's business. Well, remember... To agree, you have to have faith, and you already have faith, because everybody here has faith in their emotions, right? Whether your emotions deserve to be worthy of faith is up to you to decide, but I don't know about you, but the more faith I put in my, in my emotions, the more sideways my life just seems to get. Amen. Anyone else agree? So we're going to jump into the passage. Uh, really quick, anybody here kind of a history buff? A little bit. I'm going to get technical for a second. So let's open up this passage. Ready for something really inspiring and exciting? Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Traconius, and Licinius was a tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John. Who? Isn't that preachable? Make a praise chorus out of that. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Well, why in the world would you spend... Have you ever wondered how we know when Jesus lived? And how, why we say he was born 2 B.C.? And why we say that he was crucified either where between 31 and 33 B.C.? Have you ever wondered how they date that? Yes. That. Okay, We date that by specific dates based on the calendar that we use. But in history, the way that they date a situation or place is by the rulers. Now, to this, this means nothing to us. But if, if you were to tell a story and you were to say, well, it was the seventh year of President Obama's reign. Jay Inslee was the governor of Washington. Condon was the mayor of Spokane. Uh, uh, O'Quinn was recently appointed to be the county commissioner. Joe Whitwer was still at Life Center, and Sean was in about his eighth year at Living Hope. Luca got dedicated. Did you see how all of these things kind of overlap? That's how they date things. And, and the reason I wanted to point this out is, it's really easy to just look at the Bible as being a religious document. It's a historical document. These are all re real people, and these are all things you can go back to to find out when it was Jesus lived. Now, the reason that we're kind of, why, why, we, why we can narrow it down to one or two year period is because that's how long all of these things over, overlap. Does that make sense? All right, I hope you found that interesting, because I did. And I've got the microphone. Uh, John the Baptist, then, verse 3, he came into all the dis district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it was written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, 
The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, the rough road smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this is because my eyes just got completely blown open by something. Anyone here know what it's like to be praying for a person or a situation so long you don't know what to pray for? Okay. I saw this line. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. And I said, oh, okay. I got to jump on this. So hold that thought in your mind for a second because we're going to get back to it. After John says this, he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. How's that for seeker sensitive? Imagine if I welcomed everyone at your, welcome to living hope. You brood of vipers. John then, ne then spends the next three verses detailing all of the sins that these people are caught up in. So this is a very heavy moment. And the, it resolves with the crowds were questioning him saying, then what shall we do? And of course he says, repent. God will encounter your world and your lives will change. Now here's the first part I want you to take away from this. John as an individual, started a radical revolution in the lives of the people he talked with, right? Okay, hold that in your mind because we're going to get back to this. And here's the other thing I want you to notice when it comes to praying for people we love. I looked at this thing that he said, and my mind was completely blown. And I thought, this is how all flesh will see the salvation of God. So if you've got somebody who's in addiction, if you've got someone who's far away from God, who's killing themselves, I want you to notice, this is how I'm starting to pray for people. Number one, that the ravines will be filled. That the past situations in their life, the low points, so ravine, like a, like a valley, the low points will be brought up. So whatever in their past has driven them away from God, it's going to start driving them towards God. Second thing, that the mountains are brought low. Paul talks about lies exalting themselves above God, almost like a mountain. So in that case, I pray for the strong lies to be pulled down. Third thing I do is the path straight. What's the current situation that's making it difficult for them to get where they need to go? And then fourthly, for the rough roads to become smooth. How do we get the wrong people out of our loved one's lives? Okay, let me show you what it looks like. Who, somebody give me the first name of somebody who needs prayer. Christine, in the name of Jesus, we pray that Christine, everything in her past that has broken her heart and has brought her suffering, it will lead her towards Jesus, not away from Jesus. We pray, Lord, that the lies that Christine is believing will be brought low, whether it's a lie of addiction that says she must feel comfortable, with, whether it's a lie of purpose that says she has no way to live, that those mountains will be brought down. We pray in her current situation that you will straighten out the path so she can come back to you. And ultimately, if she's walking a road with some rough people, we pray, Lord, you find a way to move them out. Is that awesome? Is that awesome? So, so write that down. Take a picture of it. This is a great way to pray for people in your world. Okay, so let's jump back into where we were going. So John the Baptist comes in. He's telling people to, you, to instigate a divine intervention. This is what you have to do. You have to get rid of the sin in your life, and then God's going to enter in. Well, I thought, okay, what does Paul say about that same situation? So we're going now to Ephesians chapter 2. And here's how Paul describes it. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And he describes it by his being, living according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Paul makes the case very plain. Before you come to Jesus... Your life is going along the path that the devil wants you to walk. 
Now, that doesn't mean that everyone is demon-possessed by any stretch of the imagination. But before you come to Jesus, your flesh, that part of you that demands comfort, is going to take you away from where God wants you to be. Would anyone agree that that's true? Okay. And by the way, this is another example where Paul clearly says, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's, he's in charge of what's going on in this planet unless we put Jesus in charge. But then verse 4, but God. Everybody say, but God. Let's go in the wrong direction. But God. Turn me around. I was stuck in my addiction. But God. Reached in. My marriage was falling apart. But God. Are, are, are those six good letters? <laughs> I don't know what you brought in today, but let me give you a really good word of encouragement. But God. Amen? Amen? I could quit right there. I'm not going to. But God made us alive together with Jesus. So we were dead. We we're living according to the prince of the power of the air. But God made us alive. And not only alive, we are together with Jesus. Christians should never say they feel alone. Right? We're together with Jesus. And raised up with him. We should never say we're stuck. Because just as Jesus got raised, we got raised. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Who, who's seated in heaven on the throne? God. Who's sitting, sitting right next to him? Jesus. Who's in Jesus? We are. Have you ever felt far from God? Well, what would Paul say? You might feel far from God, but there is a part of your spirit right now that is in heaven, in Jesus, sitting next to God the Father. How does it work? I have no clue, but I like it. I have no clue how my car runs, but I drive it. Is that good news? So John the Baptist gives this list of things that we need to change. But as Christians, because remember, John the Baptist is an Old Testament person. Yes, he's written about in the New Testament, but he doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside of him. He's an Old Testament person. So what he told them to do is different than what we do. Because Jesus, so when he said, you know, flee from the wrath to come, well, Jesus took the wrath of God, right? So now we are in a different situation. Does that make sense? Do you see the connection there? Good. But I wanted to bring this up. The, the, Paul then goes on to say, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, so it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that anyone may boast. Now, I'm going to get a little theological for a second. Two main camps in the Christian world. One is the Calvinist camp, one is the Wesleyan camp. We are in the Wesleyan camp, okay? The Calvinist camp believes that before you get saved, God has to change your heart before you can repent and be saved. In other words, God is an outside force, comes in, and makes you alive so you can repent. Okay? I don't believe that's true. And the, the reason they believe this is they will say, God has to give you the faith, and the faith isn't of yourselves, it's a gift of God, so that nobody will boast about having faith. Okay? Here's the problem with that. This passage is actually saying the gift of God is salvation. It's not faith. The reason we know this, if you remember last week, Romans chapter 12, every person on the planet has a measure of faith. Okay? Everyone has faith. Atheists have faith. Agnostics have faith. Everybody has faith. The question is, what do you have faith in? Does that make sense? Faith is like swallowing. Everybody does it. It just depends on what you swallow. Okay? The reason this is important is salvation is the gift of God. 
Salvation is not a part of works. Every time Paul mentions works, he's talking about works of the Old Testament, works of the law. If you do the works, then you can boast. Paul's saying, no, it's by grace that you get saved, not by works. Does that make sense? Okay, now hold on to that thought for a second. So we're, we're contrasting what John the Baptist said a little bit because he was Old Testament. But here's the part I want you to get. There is some thinking going around Christianity, and it's always been around Christianity, that says because you're saved by faith, what you do after you get saved doesn't matter. And if you try to, if you do things like reading the Bible and sharing your faith and serving people and, and, and uh, investing in the lives of other people, if you try doing these things after you get saved, you are doing works. Okay? They'll say things like, religion says do, Jesus says done. Have you heard that one get thrown around? That's true when it comes to salvation. When it comes to salvation, entering into faith, Jesus does everything. We say, yes. It's not a work, it's a response. It's a response out of love. Now, here's the point, though. After you get saved, if you want to become more like Jesus, if you want the promises of God to be active in your life, what you do matters. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. See, obedience is an issue of love. It's not an issue of works. It's not an issue of legalism. Okay? When I turn off the TV and go pray in the, at earlier at night than normal, it's not because I fear God's going to judge me. It's because I love Jesus so much that the more I become like Jesus, the more my life follows under his hand. The more I become like Jesus, the better my marriage gets, the better my parenting gets, the better my other job gets, the better you all become. And it's not an issue of, I got to do this. It's, I love Jesus. Does that make sense? Because here's what people miss. The people saying this. Well, you can't be doing spiritual works because then you boast and then you get proud and it's all by grace. What they miss is the very next verse. Okay. This is eight. This is nine. Welcome to ten. For we are his workmanship. We are his expression. We are his perfect artistic expression. That's really what it means. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Salvation is not a result of works. Okay? That is absolutely grace. But guess what? After you get saved, grace takes you into good works. Do you see the distinction? And the reason I want you to catch this is the reason the American church is dying on the vine is because too many Christians have been told you don't have to share your faith because God's going to save who God's going to save. And you don't have to read your Bible because, well, you don't want to be legalistic. And you don't need to turn off the TV and go pray because, well, you don't want to be legalistic. Okay? That's sucking the church dry. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to do a small shift because I'm going to explain this workmanship. How many of you know, how many of you like coming every week to see which crazy analogy I'm going to come up with this week? Oh, good. <laughs> I would have wept openly if nobody raised their hand. It's like, what am I doing all week? Anyway. This may be my favorite one. It may be my oldest one. I'm wondering if Lynn is going to remember it. If she doesn't, I won't mind at all because this, this one might be 20. When was Jacob Slatter? 22 years ago? 19 years ago? Zach, how old are you? Almost, you're not... I'm your dad. You really want to be talking about shoulds? <laughs> um, you're 19. You were born right after Jacob Slaughter started. So this one might be, this one might be 18 or 19 years old. 
And this is one, and by the way, folks, this is another one of these analogies that comes because I journal and because I have my pen open and I write down what I think God says. Okay? You can do this too. It's all about art restoration. Lynn, do you remember this a little? Oh, good. Actually, she's probably heard it 25 times in 20 years, but I haven't done it in a while. We are his workmanship. We are his artistic expression. Look at your neighbor and say, you are God's artistic expression. And remember, this is the same God who paints sunrises and sunsets. This is the same God that created the planet. I mean, this, this planet may be the only one inhabited and in, in under the rule of the enemy, but who the heck are we kidding? It's pretty. Right? But we are the image of God. We are his artistic expression. But here's the problem. Because our world is so fallen, the junk and grime of life covers up the beautiful painting. Now, can you still see the beautiful painting underneath the grime? A little bit. How many of you have somebody in your life and you're looking at the choices they've made and you're looking at where they are and you're looking at the destruction, the, the, the stealing, killing, and destroying the devil is doing in their life and you go, you could be so much more. And it just, it just, it crushes you. One of the addicts in our church, if, if, if you, when, when this person gets, gets set free, is going to be Joyce Myers. Absolutely, completely convinced. And you, we all have somebody like that, don't we? Dirt and grime is certainly there, but you can still see what's underneath. So when we come to Jesus, the first thing he does is he cleans off the dirt and grime. And every time we come back to him, every morning, Lord, I am so thankful that you forgive me every day. I am so grateful that, that I'm not stuck in my wants and my whining and my demand for comfort and my demand to eat double quarter pounders with cheese while I binge watch Grey's Anatomy. I am so glad you set me free from all of that. Amen? But here's the other part. Life and people in our life then spray paint messages on top of our masterpiece. And so, this, this lady in the masterpiece, when she looks at the mirror, what does she see? What's the first thing she sees? She sees the junk people have spray painted. Okay? The way you get set free is you agree with your identity. I am God's masterpiece. And then over time, you ask yourself, what is the graffiti that got sprayed on top of me? Is it that you're unlovable? Is it that you're only good for one thing? Is it that you're second best? Is it that you fail at everything? And what you do is you are find out what the graffiti is. And here's the absolute guarantee. Whatever the graffiti is, whatever the loudest voice is, God is is saying the absolute opposite. Amen. Absolute opposite. Yes. And so if, if, if the graffiti on your face is you're always a screw up, you're never going to amount to anything, well, guess what that means? That means I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. It's plans to prosper you and give you a future and give you a hope. Because folks, if all you're doing is you're looking at these messages, why not go on meth? Why not go on heroin? That'll give you a lot more comfort, right? But we have to find what the messages are. And I'm going to say this again because somebody here didn't catch it the first time. Whatever the spray paint is, God is doing the absolute opposite, but you have to agree with it. Does that make sense? He will take care of the grime. He will take care of the grime. But if you don't, if you don't wrestle with these issues, and by the way, folks, I've been a Christian for 40 years. I've been a licensed pastor for 21. I'm still scraping off spray paint. 
I got set free from something three weeks ago, and someday I'm going to be brave enough to tell you about it. I still do this with my journal all the time. What are the core lies I'm believing? Remember the ravine? No, wait, the mountain we, we prayed down? What are the high lies that I'm still believing? Because, folks, listen. If you think you're a failure, what's going to happen in all of your relationships? Hi, I'm Sean. I'm a failure. I'm going to let you down, and you're going to reject me. Right? If you think you're unlovable, how is every relationship going to go? Hi, I'm Sean. I'm really unlovable, and at some point you're going to figure this out, and you're going to leave me alone. You're going to break my heart. And then they leave you alone, and they break your heart, and you turn around, and what do you say? See, I was right. Everybody's going to hurt me. Everybody's going to let me down. Everybody's going to break my heart. And you get angrier, and you get bitter, and you need immediate satisfaction and immediate comfort. And what do you turn to? Whatever you can. Does this make sense? Have you ever wondered why people who pick the wrong people always seem to pick the same people who are the wrong people? Right? Makes me want to sing looking for love in all the wrong places, but I won't because this is a serious moment. And, and so here, here's what I think happens. God sees us as the original masterpiece. We're convinced about the dirt and grime and the, and the, and the messages. And I think when we talk to him and we keep talking to him about the dirt and grime and the, and the lies, you know what I think he does? I think he just listens and he nods his head and he just goes, I'll wait. I'll wait. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been in a situation with a really bad salesperson who's really trying hard to sell you something? And the more they talk, the more you just say, you're not helping yourself. No, no, so no, no, no. And, and you'll smile and you'll nod your head. Oh, okay, yeah, uh-huh, yep, not, not helping yourself. Nope, I don't care if this is me and this is all my people who, anyway. Um, I almost fell into an Amway pitch. I won't. <laughs> but you know how you just sit there and you politely listen? I wonder, I wonder if sometimes our prayer time becomes a time where God and Jesus just politely listen. Because we're so busy talking about the spray paint. He's going, I, 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 I don't even see the spray paint. I've already made a way for you to get out from the spray paint. Is that fair? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he's prepared beforehand. So Jesus is looking at this amazing life. He's looking at this bright future. He's looking at all of these things he wants to empower you with. But you've got to agree with him first. Is that fair? I had a sibling, I'm not going to say who it was, <laughs> who used to argue with my dad while asking my dad for something. <laughs> okay? I mean, we've all probably done it on some level where, where you're angry at the father you want to give you something. And I just used to listen, and I, I used to go, brick wall, forehead. At some point, your forehead will realize this brick wall isn't going to change. And it's not that my dad didn't want to do something for him. Right? And I wonder how often, because we're not willing to confront the lies, because it's, it's uncomfortable. It is. But folks, let me just ask you something. Do you want to be uncomfortable living in the lies? Or do you want to be uncomfortable for a moment while you get healed? You're already uncomfortable. 
Do you want the uncomfortable of, of hanging around the wrong people and having them destroy your life? Or do you want the uncomfortable of being alone a little bit so you can find the right people? Hello? Do you want the uncomfortable of the broken arm or do you want the uncomfortable of the cast that's healing the arm? Right? All right. Where are we at? Ah, yes, grab your phones. Let's take a picture of your identity thoughts for this week. We're adding a couple new ones, so I, I hope you guys are pulling these up and reading these during the week because this is what Jesus believes about you whether you agree with it or not. And this week, which ones are we adding? We are adding, I am God's work of art, created for good works. We are adding, I am an instigator of divine intervention, just like John the Baptist. He instigated God's intervention. And we're going to read, and this is also a new one. I am seated with Christ in heaven. Okay? You know what? Let's stand up. Let's do this right. Come on. Everybody stand up. Here we go. Let's read this nice and loud. I am a new creation. I am being made new. I am a vessel of the Holy Spirit. I am seated with Christ in heaven. I am God's work of art created for good works. I have the must mindset of Jesus. I am a representative of Jesus to my world. I am an instigator of divine intervention, and my greatness comes from my service. Remember, and I have to be specific about this every week, you don't say these things to impress God. You say these things to agree with what's already true. You say these things to replace the junk that's kicking around your brain for as long as you've been alive. Okay? And remember, the new ones. I am seated with Christ in heaven. When you wake up in the morning, you should never feel hopeless. You should never feel alone because you are sitting next to your heavenly father and he loves to talk. Amen. Your dad might not love like to talk. Your heavenly father does. You are God's work of art created for good works. You should never wake up in the morning and say, I don't have anything to do. I don't have anything important to do. I'm a loser. I have nothing going for me. No, you are God's masterpiece. And he's got amazing things for you. And whenever you look at the junk in the world and you say to yourself, there's nothing I can do. No, you instigate a divine intervention. Amen? Amen. Let's do this one more time, no mumbling. Here we go. I am a new creation. I am being made new. I am a vessel of the Holy Spirit. I am seated with Christ in heaven. I am God's work of art created for good works. I have the must mindset of Jesus. I am a representative of Jesus to my world. I am an instigator of divine intervention. And my greatness comes from my service. And in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we seal this moment, Father. We will walk out of here full of your Holy Spirit, ready to give it away to everybody we know. We will instigate divine interventions from our place in heaven seated next to Christ because we are your workmanship created for good works and no weapon formed against us will prosper and we are going to walk in the fullness of your Holy Spirit this week. I can't wait for a couple months when this list is like 50 long and that's the whole service. Won't that be fun? All right, amen. God bless you. Have a good week. We'll see you next week. Uh, next, after second service, spaghetti feed.